Welcome, people. And this is an MS News Now program. We are speaking about comorbidities tonight with multiple sclerosis. And that means what else is ailing you? What else, what other disease state might you have? Or even if it's not actually a disease state, but like it could be something like migraine that people don't think is a disease, but I guess the severity of migraine, it could be a disease. Take it away. Thank you so much, Stuart. Howdy, hello, hi, everyone. Um, Aaron Boster here from not so sunny Columbus, Ohio, uh, where I, I run the uh, Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis. Uh, Stuart um, and MS Vision News is an outstanding organization. I'm really excited to be here today to talk with you guys. And I've been asked to discuss a really relevant topic uh, in clinical MS neurology. That's the topic of comorbidities. Now, comorbidities sounds like a Scrabble word. It's and it really, in doctor language, means other stuff that you have going on in addition to the diagnosis that we're talking about. So people are not a disease. So you're not MS or diabetes or cancer. You're a human. You have a name. You have a history. You have a life. And then you happen to have a medical condition. And to be honest with you, all too often, clinicians can sometimes forget that. Uh, and I'm embarrassed by that. And we need to um, talk about that and do a little bit better. Um, when, when you try to help someone with multiple sclerosis live their very best life, despite having the condition, we're going to do things specifically to address the multiple sclerosis. So we're going to use, for example, disease modifying therapies to slow the disease down, to prevent new attacks from occurring, to prevent new brain and spinal cord damage as seen as spots on the MRI. We're gonna do things to preserve the neurologic reserve and to help you not get worse in your neurological examination. And doing those things to help your MS is very, very important. And it's wholly inadequate to help that person live their best life. It's not enough. If I want to go home at night and feel proud that I've done the best job that I can, I need to address the multiple sclerosis I need to try to slow down the disease as I just described. And in addition, I have to address other concerns, medical concerns, which can erode the quality of your life. And that is to say that when we work with someone who has MS, we have to remember that they're not an MS, that doesn't exist. They're a human. And the human may have MS and they also may have some other conditions. My late mentor, Dr. Omar Khan, was very fond of saying, Aaron, sometimes nature is too generous and you can have more than one thing. And that's exactly what I wanna talk with you guys tonight about is more than one thing. So when you talk about comorbid conditions in the setting of MS, I really would like to consider it in three separate sections. So we're gonna start the discussion talking about symptoms which in and of themselves are their own condition, which are very, very common in the setting of multiple sclerosis. So I'm gonna spend some time talking about that. And it's my assumption that many people who may be joining in right now will identify many of those things as things they may have actually experienced themselves. Then I wanna broaden our discussion and talk about comorbid conditions that someone with MS can have as it relates to other autoimmune conditions. So someone with MS can have yet a second or even a third autoimmune condition. And time allowing, I want to expand the conversation to encompass the rest of medicine outside of neurology and immunology. So let's jump in after a sip of apple juice. And I wanna talk about conditions or symptoms that are very, very common in the setting of MS and they need to not be ignored. I wanna start with mood. Depression is a disease, right? I suffer from depression. Um, anxiety is a disease. And human beings can experience depression and anxiety. Untreated, it can destroy the quality of your life. People impacted by MS are twice as likely to experience a bout of depression or a bout of anxiety as compared to the general population. It would be a fool of a doctor, in my opinion, to work with someone impacted by MS and not pay attention to their mood. In fact, there's some very disturbing evidence that if you don't adequately treat depression in someone with MS, you can actually make the disease get worse faster, which is terrifying. 
And so when you think about comorbid conditions, I wanna start off the discussion with thinking about mental health and about a psychiatric condition like depression or anxiety. And a long time ago, um, a very disgruntled general neurologist off sort of in an off color way said, well, I don't treat depression, that's for psychiatrists. And I don't think that guy should really take care of people with MS because if you ignore the comorbid condition, you make the disease MS worse and everything is gray. And so at the Boster Center for MS, we do a tremendous effort of trying to dig in to mood. And we try to do all kinds of tricks and tips to augment mood. And that's the first comorbid condition that I wanted to discuss. The second one, sticking with the up there's, is cog fog, so cognitive impairment. So all of us, as we age, might be slightly more forgetful than we were 10 years earlier. Uh, and it's not uncommon that you'll hear someone say, oh, I had a senior moment, referencing the fact that they forgot something for a moment and then it came back to them or what have you. Cognitive impairment is in and of itself an entire field of neurology, actually. And it's true that in the setting of multiple sclerosis, people can develop difficulties with thinking and memory. It's actually pretty common. Um, well over 50% of people may have some degree of difficulty with thinking and memory. And if all we're doing to help someone with MS is giving them a disease modifying therapy, we're missing the boat. Because a lot of people, their jobs demand that they're on point. If I'm taking care of a lawyer and she can't read through a brief, she ain't gonna be a lawyer for very long. And so at the same time that we're gonna help someone with their MS, slowing the disease down, we have to consider the comorbid condition of cognitive impairment. Now, fortunately, there are a host of things that can be done to augment cognition. And those things work in people impacted by MS. The next comorbid condition that I wanna to talk to you about is one that is all too common in MS. In fact, it is one of the most common symptoms that people with MS experience, and that's chronic fatigue. So otherwise put, we could talk about chronic fatigue syndrome, which is its own condition. Fatigue being the leading cause of loss of work amongst people with MS, fatigue being the most common symptom that people experience with MS, it's also an invisible phenomenon. So people looking at you can't see it. Uh, and, and that can be a really big problem. Just like with cognitive impairments, just like with depression, the comorbid condition of cognitive impairment is diagnosable and it's treatable. And there are a host of things that we can do to try to augment cognitive performance in someone impacted by MS. Moving on, I wanna switch gears and we'll talk about the down there's. And so it's extremely common that people impacted by MS can develop difficulties with bowel, bladder, or bedroom. And bladder problems are its own condition in and of itself. People impacted by MS can develop what's called overactive bladder, which is exactly what it sounds like. When I gotta go, I got about 10 seconds or less before I wet myself. I have to constantly get up all the time. I wake up several times a night to go to the bathroom. Sometimes I don't make it and I have to carry a spare change of underpants in my briefcase. Overactive bladder is extremely common in MS. It is a urologic problem. Now it's caused by the MS, but it is its own comorbid condition. And I recently sat with a family and the gal who is my patient started on a new medicine for her bladder. And she shared something with me that warmed my heart. Now this was just, I think I saw her yesterday. She said, because of that medicine, I'm no longer scared to leave my home. Because prior to this, she had such a challenge with wetting herself that she didn't wanna leave her house, which is abominable. The comorbid condition of bladder urgency, of overactive bladder, is easily treatable. And if the neurologist, for example, doesn't have savvy or is not comfortable in that space, that's okay. I want you as the human with the bladder problem to say, fine doc, then send me to a urologist who can help me with that problem. Similarly, sexual dysfunction is unfortunately rather common for both boys and girls with multiple sclerosis. It is very common that people impacted by MS can develop either erectile dysfunction or difficulty with uh, uh, sexual sensation or lubrication, or they can have difficulty or inability to orgasm. Now, if you wanna talk about a terrible comorbid condition, erectile dysfunction or anorgasmia or pain with intercourse are abominable. And just like with bladder, they are easily treated. 
Now, that's a comorbid condition that is worth treating because it improves the quality of your life. It improves Friday, it makes Friday fantastic. Treating in this example erectile dysfunction doesn't slow down the multiple sclerosis. It's a comorbid condition, but it destroys quality of life. And so I think it's terribly important that we address that. Again, if your neurologist is uncomfortable, okay, then say, that's fine, doc, but I want you to send me to a pelvic floor physical therapist. I want you to send me to a urologist or someone that can help me with that problem. Other comorbid conditions that are very common in MS involve ouchy yaya. So I wanna talk about neuropathic pain and I wanna talk about spasticity. Both are exceedingly common in the setting of MS. And so many humans have different forms of neuropathic pain and people with MS very commonly experience neuropathic pain. Now pain is its own comorbid condition. There's an entire field of medicine called pain medicine, specialists that just deal with pain. And MS has lots of different kinds of pain. And so at the Boster Center, we spend a tremendous amount of time using lotions and potions to try to help people better manage their discomfort, their pain. And sometimes our, uh, our Kung Fu is not strong enough and the medicines that I use aren't adequate. And so we have to send the patient for advanced testing or advanced treatment. We'll send them to a pain specialist. Um, I have patients that have massively benefited from spinal cord stimulators, which I adore. I have patients that have massively benefited from pain pumps or from pain injections. My point here is, if we're giving you a medicine to slow down your MS, that's great. But if you have a burning sensation in your hand and it hurts to touch it, that's not okay with me. That is a comorbid condition called pain and we need to address that. Now, keeping in the topic of pain, spasticity hurts like the Dickens. Spasticity is a situation where opposing muscle groups are no longer talking nicely in the sandbox. So when you wanna bring your arm this way, this muscle says, no, 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 I wanna still do that. And then you get a tug of war across your arm and it manifests as cramps, spasms, charley horses. Spasticity is its own field. There are doctors that are spasticity doctors, that's all they do. And uh, we deal with spasticity very frequently in the setting of MS, upwards of 70% of people with MS have spasticity. And so if we're gonna help someone not have a spasm and fall down, not have a cramp and you know writhe in pain, not have a leg that won't bend to get in the car, then we need to address that spasticity along with the underlying multiple sclerosis. And there are a host of things that can be done for spasticity, ranging from stretching and physical therapy to intrathecal baclofen pumps and Botox injections. My point here is that is a comorbid condition with if not treated can erode the quality of your life and that's not okay. Keeping with the topic of pain, I wanna talk about headaches or migraines. So migraines are very common. And people impacted by MS are twice as likely to experience migraine headaches compared to the general population. At the Boster Center, we treat a lot of headaches and we use headache cocktails, we use IV infusions for headaches, we use shots that people take monthly. I do a lot of headache Botox management where we actually use botulinum toxin to reduce headaches. And again, having a migraine won't make your MS get worse faster, but it'll make it so you can't work or go to dinner or hold down a meal or have a conversation. I have patients that literally will have migraines more than 14, 15 times a month. And so addressing that comorbid condition is critically important. Within the broad field of neurology, headache neurology is an entire field. And if you have medically refractory migraines or your MS neurologist is not feeling comfortable treating your migraines, you can ask for a referral to a headache specialist. There may be a headache specialist in the same neurology department where you see the MS guy, and you can have those things treated. Before we shift gears and kind of broaden our discussion, I wanna talk about just a couple more comorbid conditions which kind of are very common in the setting of MS. The first one is seizures. So a seizure is an electrical storm on the brain. And when you have a seizure, that part of the brain goes offline, and a seizure can be quick, it can be a few seconds or 30 seconds, um, but it can cause a terrible car crash. You could, God forbid, drown in a, in a tub. Um, you can fall down and injure yourself. I mean, having a seizure, an electrical storm on your brain is bad news bears. 
and seizures are unfortunately very common in the setting of MS. People with MS are six times as likely to experience a seizure compared to the general population. But here's the good news. They're very easy to treat. There are a host of seizure medicines. And if someone in my practice with MS also has seizures, then we treat the seizures as well. And with, with modern medicines, very oftentimes with one or sometimes two pills, we can knock the seizures out of the park and allow them to have a normal life, which is a really big deal. Epilepsy is a subfield in neurology. There are entire practices where all they do is seizure management. And if I'm having trouble managing a complex seizure, I'm delighted that I have friends that I can refer to who are headache specialists and they can help us in that area. The last comorbid condition that I, I certainly do not want to miss is a really important one, and that is thinning bones. So people impacted by MS over the age of 50, 50, both boys and girls, independent from steroids, have a risk of accelerated bone thinning. And if your bones thin too much, then we call that osteopenia. And if they thin even more, we call that osteoporosis. And thinning bones are a major problem. People with MS are at risk of falling. And if you fall on a weak hip, it could shatter, God forbid, or you could break your femur. And we need to be aware that people impacted by MS are at high risk of thinning bones, and we need to do things to thwart that. We wanna make sure that people over the age of 50 who have MS are getting a bone density scan, a DEXA, D-E-X-A scan. And if they are found to have thinning bones, we want to intervene with medicines, lotions, and potions, and physiotherapy to help beef up those bones. So as we engage in a conversation tonight about comorbid conditions that uh, can impact people with MS, I want you to keep in mind that several are very, very proximal to the disease. The up there's chronic fatigue, cognitive impairment, depression, and anxiety. We think about comorbid conditions about the down there. So bladder dysfunction, bowel or sexual dysfunction. We think about a host of pain syndromes. So neuropathic pain in your limbs or in your body or in your face, headaches, spasticity. And I wanted to mention seizures and also osteopenia. So now I'm going to go from things related to MS directly to other comorbid autoimmune conditions. So I'm going to broaden the discussion a little bit after a sip of apple juice. So MS is an autoimmune condition. Autoimmunity is a phenomenon where the, the system in your body that fights off bad guys makes an error in judgment. And instead of attacking a bad guy, it by accident attacks you. And there are many, many autoimmune conditions. I think there's probably well over a hundred different autoimmune conditions. Multiple sclerosis, obviously, is an autoimmune condition where the immune system inappropriately attacks the holiest of holies, the supercomputer that runs the body, the brain, and the spinal cord, the superhighway that takes the information from the brain down to the feet and back up. And obviously, in the setting of treating MS, we want to do things, disease-modifying therapies and the like, to prevent that damage from occurring. People impacted by MS are, in my opinion, at a higher likelihood of experiencing other autoimmune conditions. And so, as I was trained, if you have MS, an autoimmune condition, you are more likely to have a second autoimmune condition, or, and you're gonna see autoimmunity in your family. So invariably, when I take a family history, I'll find an aunt or an uncle that has a different kind of autoimmune condition. But I wanna spend a few minutes and talk about comorbid autoimmunity. And I wanna focus on treatment because I love twofers. A twofer is when I get two for the price of one, because interestingly, some of the medicines used to treat MS also treat other autoimmune conditions. So let's try to discuss them right now. A very common autoimmune condition is when the immune system destroys the joints of the hand um, or other large joints, and this is called rheumatoid arthritis. You may have heard of rheumatoid arthritis. This is unfortunately a very disfiguring and painful autoimmune condition, and it can be treated lots of different ways. One of the ways that we treat autoimmune condition rheumatoid arthritis is with a medicine called rituximab. So many of you listening right now may have heard of rituximab because we use it off-label frequently to treat multiple sclerosis. And it's a very potent, very successful medicine. And so when I have a patient who has both multiple sclerosis, 
and rheumatoid arthritis. I will liaise with the rheumatologist. And if the condition is bad enough, we will put them on a medicine like rituxan or one of the other B cell depleting medicines and treat both conditions for the price of one. There's another MS medicine called Abagio. Abagio is a pill that you swallow and it is a medicine for MS. It's been on the market since 2013. Abagio is the first metabolite of an ancient drug for rheumatoid arthritis called Arava. When you swallow Arava, the first metabolite becomes Abagio. So they're basically the same medicine. And another way of treating comorbid autoimmune rheumatoid arthritis with MS is to use Abagio. And I've done that many times. In fact, sometimes we do both Rituxan and Abagio. And so it's really kind of awesome when we can get a twofer. And there are several other twofers that we can consider. I want to talk about some autoimmune conditions that involve the gut. So uh, Crohn's disease is a very nasty autoimmune condition. Uh, it's not that uncommon. I have several patients, unfortunately, who suffer from both Crohn's disease and they suffer from multiple sclerosis. And we can use a very potent medicine. It's a very, very powerful medicine for MS called natalizumab, Tysabri. So Tysabri, interestingly, has an FDA indication, not just for MS, it's also approved for Crohn's. And I have some patients that have successfully taken one medicine and treated both conditions. So not only are we preventing MS attacks, but we're also healing gut mucosa and we're preventing uh, gut damage. There's another um, inflammatory bowel disease called ulcerative colitis, which is kind of like a second cousin of Crohn's disease. And ulcerative colitis is a very nasty condition, but it's treated, interestingly, with a drug called ozonamide. So ozonamide is a pill which is FDA approved for MS. And if someone has both multiple sclerosis and comorbid ulcerative colitis, you can treat both conditions with one pill using ozonamide. The last comorbid autoimmune condition that I want to discuss is called psoriasis. Psoriasis is an unpleasant autoimmune condition where you get these scaly patches on your skin and they can be painful and they can bleed. And sometimes there's actually systemic problems that we can see with psoriasis. And interestingly, in Germany, there's a medicine for psoriasis, which is not available in the United States, called Fumiderm. Fumiderm is a fumaric ester salt, and so is Tecfidera and Vumerity. Tecfidera's real name is dimethylfumarate, and Vumerity's real name is diroxamal fumarate. And when you swallow either drug and it goes in your stomach, the first metabolite is a drug called monomethylfumarate. And that drug will also treat psori uh, psoriatic arthritis or psoriasis. And so I have plenty of patients who have gotten a twofer where they're taking Vumerity twice a day or they're taking Tecfidera twice a day and they're treating both their MS and their psoriasis, which is always really very cool. It wouldn't be appropriate to leave the topic of autoimmunity if I didn't talk about thyroid. Now, I don't have a clever twofer with thyroid, but I would submit to you that if someone with MS has a second autoimmune condition, it's most commonly a thyroid problem. Thyroids are easily diagnosed with labs that can be drawn anywhere. And they're oftentimes very easily managed with simply with a medicine here or there. And so it's important to consider the thyroid in someone with MS because an abnormal thyroid can cause all kinds of neurological like symptoms, fatigue and cold limbs and weight gain and, and all kinds, a host of things which could be confused for some of the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. So in the last few minutes, we've talked about comorbid things that are very common in MS like spasticity and like bladder dysfunction. And then I broadened our conversation a little bit to talk about other comorbid autoimmune conditions that someone with MS might have. I want to wrap up now, broadening our conversation even more to talk about other conditions which are very commonly seen in human beings, including human beings that happen to have multiple sclerosis. And I want to really highlight cardiovascular stuff. So for example, high blood pressure diabetes, high cholesterol, tobacco use, and alcohol use. So those are considered cardiovascular risk factors. And unfortunately, it's very, very common that my patient may have MS and high blood pressure. I have many patients that have MS and diabetes or high cholesterol 
I have patients that despite it being 2024, they still smoke cigarettes or I have patients that excessively use alcohol. And those are cardiovascular risk factors. Those behaviors can cause the brain to shrink faster than we would like, can cause the arteries of the brain to harden faster. And what we have learned is very disturbing. If you have a comorbid high blood pressure or cholesterol or diabetes, and you don't treat it adequately, your neurological status, your MS gets worse faster, which is scary. So if we are gonna do our very best job helping someone impacted by MS live their very best life, we have to consider other cardiovascular risk factors because treating a blood pressure doesn't just help your heart, it helps your brain. Treating diabetes doesn't just preserve the blood vessels that supply the heart, it also preserves the blood vessels that supply the brain. And so we could reframe what we're talking about as brain health. But in the context of comorbid conditions, if you have um, a comorbid cardiovascular condition, we most certainly want to treat it. Before I wrap up, I want to talk about the comorbid condition, obesity. So obesity is not the result of someone who's lazy and doesn't pay attention. And that is a terrible thing for someone to think. Obesity is actually a disease. And over the past few years, we've done some amazing work in understanding the underlying pathophysiology of obesity. And obesity is common uh, amongst Americans, and it's common amongst Americans with MS. And the comorbid condition obesity can really create a very serious problem. If you're carrying 50 extra pounds or 10 extra pounds on your belly or on your butt, and your left leg becomes weak from an attack, those extra pounds might make it so that you can't hold your weight on that weak leg. If you, on the other hand, were to lose 50 pounds, you would be able to navigate walking on that leg with much more success. And so I wanna call out obesity. Now, there's lots of things that can be done to treat comorbid obesity. In many of my patients, uh, particularly my patients who have MS, diabetes, and obesity, have started to take these fantastic new age medicines like Manjobi that can help facilitate losing weight. Now, the data is scant, but my initial assessment is that these drugs are safe in the setting of MS and may even have some immune benefits, but more to come on that topic. Lastly, before I turn this back over to Stuart and we open up the lines to take uh, your questions about comorbid conditions, I want to touch on cancer. So, as humans live longer, we increase our risk of cancer. And we have to have an open mind so that we can screen for cancer. Now, a best practice is to do what's called age-appropriate cancer screening. And this is not unique to MS. On the contrary, all adults should do this. So when you are of the age of the colonoscopy, whoop, you get a tube up the tushy so that we can make sure that there's no scary polyps. You need to have your skin checked once a year by a dermatologist. I like to call them the Nike doctor. So they can look at all the creases and cracks and crevices and make sure that all the moles look okay. If you have a cervix, you need to have a pap smear. If you have a prostate, you need to have a prostate exam and a PSA check. Making sure as an adult human that you are up to date with your cancer screening is a critically important thing to do. Cancer caught early oftentimes can be thwarted. That same cancer caught late can end you. And I would hate to control your MS and allow a comorbid condition like that to get the better hand. My name is Aaron Boster, and this is the very first time I've talked about this topic of comorbid conditions and multiple sclerosis. And so I want to thank Stuart and MS Visa News for giving me the opportunity. And I want to kick it back to our hosts so we can open up the lines and I can field your questions. Hey everybody, thank you very, very much, Dr. Boster. And I just wanna let everybody know that I too can say that this is the very first time that we are providing this topic for a program. And I'm glad that I chose Dr. Boster, my friend, to be able to do this. And as long as I'm telling you that he's my friend, I want everybody to know that yesterday was his birthday. Yay. <laughs> Thanks, thank you. All right. I was going to send him roses, but I didn't think he would appreciate getting roses. I would, love, I would send me roses. I would love it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. All right. We'll save that for next year, though. And I plan on being here, and he plans on being here, so we can do it at that time. Love it.
All right, we have a lot of questions, as was expected, but I want you to know, even though we do have a lot of questions, there are more than 60 people online, and we do hope that others will ask questions as well. And by the way, I'm wearing a lumbered shirt jacket, uh, sh shirt, because it was chilly in South Florida today. Imagine that. It was a whole 52 degrees when I woke up this morning. And uh, yes, for a lot of you saying 52, oh my God, what is this guy talking about? Well, 52 for down here is quite chilly. So much so that um, it actually felt colder than when I was in North Carolina this weekend. I left wow. there on Sunday. I left there on Sunday, it was 29 degrees. And that 29 degrees felt warmer than this 52 degrees, oddly. Okay. We All right. Visit us in Ohio in March, Stuart. That's right. That's right. I can't wait because, you know, every time we're there, it snows. So I'm looking <laughs> forward to that. All right. First question. Well, I, I have a lot of questions. All right. Let's go with the first one that, that was thrown my way. And that is, um, how does cog fog actually get treated? Is there a treatment for this? Yes. So the, the cognitive impairment that we commonly see with multiple sclerosis is not like an Alzheimer's dementia, right? So that's a very different condition. The cognitive impairment that we see with MS is a prefrontal executive functioning problem, which typically manifests as difficulty thinking on the fly or, or doing some task under pressure or maintaining a list in your head or holding calculations in your head or something like that. And it, it can also make it hard to attend so if you're listening to me right now, presumably you're attending to my voice and taking in what I'm saying. But in the setting of MS, you could be trying your darndest to listen and you can't take it in, you can't attend. So what do we do about that? Well, there are medicines which can help with cognition in MS and I use them ubiquitously. So for example, there's drugs like modafinil or armodafinil. There are other drugs like dexamphetamine salts and these medicines trick your brain into being more awake, but they also trick your brain into being more attentive. One more way uh, that we can treat cog fog is actually by treating depression. And at first you may say, did you not hear me well? I did. If you have a mood condition, it will make you not think clearly. This has been well studied. It's called pseudo dementia. And so if you treat the underlying mood, the cognition pops up. So lots of other ways to do it, but those are two big ones. Great, thank you for that. Next, um, you said something about, um, well, let's go into that later. All right, osteoporosis and blood th and bone thinning. Other than having a, um, uh, a test for osteoporosis, what would somebody do if they find out that they have thin bones? And wh what do you suggest? Do you suggest calcium intake? Do you suggest yep. using the one, some of the mainline uh, medication that's for osteoporosis? Or are there any um, complementary therapies that can be used just as well? So this is a really important topic. And you know, the obvious caveat that I can't give people listening medical advice, but I hope that you can take this information and education back to your provider to have an informed conversation. So one of the things that we can do to help strengthen the bones is stomp the ground. So as we choose ways of exercising, I love water aerobics and water activities, but they don't help bone growth. And so walking um, on the ground where you, you know, keep slamming your foot into the ground as you walk causes reactive bone growth. L weightlifting is a fantastic exercise because let's say for example, that you have a barbell on your back and you're standing, you're putting pressure on your entire axial skeleton and the skeleton responds with reactive bone growth. So choosing exercises that make you fight gravity, whether that be walking or whether that be lifting weights is a very key element in my opinion. We also can use medicines to push calcium into the bones. And there are really good medicines out there. For example, there's a medicine that we give a lot called Prolia. It's an injection that we give and it forces calcium to go into the bones. There are several supplements that I think are very relevant. And again, I want you to talk to your provider to make sure these supplements are safe for you, but there's three. Calcium is the substrate for your bones. And so you wanna make sure that you're getting enough calcium in your diet. 
Now, if you're not a good milk drinker like you were when you were a kid, or you don't eat lots and lots of cheese, you wanna make sure that you're supplementing calcium. And some people, instead of eating calcium rich products, they'll take a calcium pill. And they have things like Oscal and a bunch of other things that you can purchase at the store. Another supplement which can help is actually vitamin D. So vitamin D, in addition to helping slow down multiple sclerosis, helps push calcium into the bones. And lastly, vitamin K2 is another vitamin which can further help the vitamin D help push the calcium into the bones. So there are a host of things that can be done to thwart and try to uh, improve upon bone density. That was a really important question, thank you. Thank you. So you were saying about each of these different things, what are, your, what are you saying is the amount that people should take? Starting with, you said calcium, that they could take calcium supplements, they could take vitamin K2, they could take uh, vitamin D3. I know that vitamin D3, you should, you should actually be blood tested for, but what about the, the other two? So the, the, again, I don't wanna give like, like clear, like please take this, because I don't know the individual situations, but oftentimes like, taking like 500 of like calcium supplement with each meal is something that many, many patients do. Um, and if you buy like, for example, over the counter, I, I mentioned OSCAL earlier, it'll, that's what will be on the label. Um, K2 depends, and, and oftentimes I like to recommend products where there's vitamin D with K2 in it, so then it's like a package deal and you don't even have to think about it. Again, I don't wanna get too much into specifics because there are individual parameters for each person that we may have to consider. Uh, but those are where I would start. Okay, thank you. I'm going to stay on the same line because you were talking about walking. You were talking about the pain that could be caused by walking. So let's go with, um, um, I was looking that up as you were talking about it, and it talks about MS nerve pain in the bottom of the feet. Now, is that what you were referring to? So, so pain in your feet can come from many different things. And there are other conditions which can cause foot pain. So for example, um, the comorbid condition diabetes, very right. commonly can cause neuropathic pain in your feet. It's not uncommon at all. Um, and that's called a neuropathy where the nerves are damaged by the diabetes and it causes horrible pain. In the setting of multiple sclerosis, the spinal cord can be involved. And so it's actually called a myelopathy, which is the word for problem with your spinal cord. And that can also manifest as pain in your feet. Here's the kicker, it's treated the same way. So the neuropathic pain medicines that we use to dampen or make the pain disappear are the same. Now, the underlying cause is different. With the diabetes, we wanna control the sugar. With the MS, we wanna control the disease activity. But symptomatically, to help your feet not be ouchy yaya, we do a lot of the same things. So for example, I prescribe someone lidocaine patches today because their feet burn when they exercise. And so this way she can cut out a, a shape that she sticks on her foot before she puts her sock on. And that way, when she goes to the gym, she's not in uh, pain. We can use lots of neuropathic pain medicines. A very common one is gabapentin or Neurontin. Another very common one is pregabalin or Lyrica. There's a probably 25 that I can think of. And all of these medicines stabilize cell membranes and can help neuropathic pain. Great, thank you. By the way, they make lidocaine and roll-ons these days too. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. It helps so you don't have to cut out that patch to uh, figure out, you know, that's, the size of your leg. That's a great tip. Okay, thank you for that. All right, next, um, let's talk about um, drop foot. So when people live with MS, it can manifest lots of different ways. And unfortunately, it's not uncommon that someone can develop difficulty with walking. And there's many, many different kinds of difficulty with walking. The, the kind that we just brought up in this question is called drop foot. And I'm wondering if I can show, like, let me, let me, let me try to use my foot as an example. We'll see how this works on the interwebs. So let's see if I can get my, I don't know that it's gonna work. So no, can because you, you got a black sock on with a black pant. I mean, take off your sock and show us. All right, let so us see, no, let, us see the, let us see those feet. Oh, there you go. So, so when you walk, you have to pull your foot up to clear the ground. And sometimes the foot will drag and it will literally catch the ground and you'll, you'll fall over. Like the turf monster will grab your foot, right? Um, I guess I could have tried to show you that with this is my foot, where you're trying to clear the ground and it just drags. And so your toes will catch. But at least this way, the entire interwebs have now seen my left foot. So right. 
very, drop. very Ohioan looking. There you go. Foot drop is unfortunately very common and it can make you face plant and it can get worse as you get tired. So foot drop's a major issue. Um, there are a bunch of things that can be done to treat foot drop. So let me just list like eight. So one of them is physical therapy. Sometimes we're able to strengthen the muscle on the front of your leg called the tibialis anterior, and we can help pull that foot up. So physical therapy can sometimes help. A second thing we can do is something called a foot flexor, which is about a $40 purchase on Amazon. It's a cloth thing that wrap, like a Velcro that wraps around your ankle with a bungee cord that goes down to the top of your shoelaces and pulls your foot up. I love them because they're inexpensive and you can throw it on and you can take it off. Um, if that's not adequate, they have something called an AFO, ankle foot orthosis, which is like another Scrabble word. It's typically something made out of Kevlar or very, very lightweight metal or sometimes plastic. And it's kind of shaped like an L, which is molded to the back of your calf and your foot and goes inside your shoe. And it just keeps your foot up like this so you can clear the ground. They have very advanced uh, uh, tools now, which are unfortunately a bit expensive, but I'll talk about two of them. The, uh, there are devices like the Bioness or the Walk Aid, which are literally these devices that have electricity that you attach onto your bottom of your leg. And when you walk, the electricity causes your foot to fire. Even though you can't do it voluntarily, it'll kick the foot up so that you can clear the ground. And most recently, I've been super excited about this thing called the psionic sleeve. So the psionic sleeve, and psionic is spelled with a C, is a neoprene sleeve that you put over your leg, and it's got eight electrodes on your quad, eight electrodes on your hamstring, eight electrodes on your calf, and eight electrodes on the front of your leg. And it can be programmed to kick your foot up at the right time to help you clear the ground. So point being is there's a host of things that we can do so that the turf monster doesn't grab your toes and then you fall while walking. All right. Thank you for that. All right. Questions from the questions. A uh, person writes, can calcium deficiency cause the difficulty or weakness to lifting legs either when walking or going up or down the stairs? Severe calcium deficiency can. Um, and severe calcium deficiency can do some bad things to your heart. Um, if you have a significant calcium deficiency, we're going to need to work very carefully with the primary care doctor or the endocrinologist to correct that. It could cause those difficulties, but typically when someone has those kind of difficulties from calcium, they've got a bunch of other problems in addition. The good news is it's very easy to check the calcium levels. It's a simple blood test, so we can figure it out together. So my question to that was going to be, what is what determines a severe calcium uh, deficiency? What number can you oh, tell us about? Um, I don't know that I could rattle off the numbers off the top of my head, Stuart. I'd have to look at okay, the scale. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. All right, next. Um, is foot drop a brain lesion or a spinal cord lesion? Is it caused from a brain lesion or a spinal cord lesion? Yes, either one. Okay, great. There you go, Kevin. All right, next. Um, Somebody wrote the drop. The answer to a drop foot is called Dr. Gretchen. Yeah. So Gretchen Howley um, is a friend of ours. Uh, she's a brilliant physical therapist on the East Coast. Um, she has an amazing book that she just wrote called "Missing the Missing Link." M S I N G Link. Um, and she has a bunch of exercises to help with foot drop. So if you don't know that gal, you should. So once a month. Dr. Gretchen does a program for MS Views and News. She's been doing this now with us since 2020, and her whole thing is called The Missing Link. And um, she does a phenomenal job, and you can find her on our YouTube channel as well. All right, next, um, what is the name of those two CogFog meds again, please? Somebody writes. Yep, so the, there's, the first two are called um, Modafinil, in R modafinil, the trade names in the United States are Pro Vigil and New Vigil. And then the other drug is an amphetamine salt called Adderall, or there's another version of it called Ritalin. Um, right. And these are all different stimulants, which have been studied and demonstrated to help with cog fog and attention in the setting of MS. They right. can make so they're, safe. so they're safe to use? 
there, every drug has side effects. So if a doctor tells you that a drug doesn't have a side effect, collect your stuff and leave their office because they're not telling you the truth. Um, the side effects of the stimulants are kind of like too much coffee. So elevated blood pressure, headache, palpitations, uh, teeth grinding, insomnia, irritability. There's a host of things that you could see, but that doesn't mean that you always do. And the vast majority of my patients tolerate these medicines swimmingly well. Thank you. For the foot drop, somebody writes, are there any specific medications or therapeutic devices to use? So I don't believe that there's medications, but we did list a couple of therapeutic devices. So a foot flexor, an ankle foot orthosis, an AFO. We talked about the Bioness or the Walkade, and we talked about the psionic sleeve. Those are all devices that can help with foot drop. I also, right. of course, want to comment that physiotherapy is probably the mainstay for improving foot drop. Great, thank you. For everybody online that are asking questions that have nothing to do with this topic, that will be last if we have time because we have to pay attention to the questions for this topic first. Okay, thank you for that. Um, going back to with what you were just saying, the psionic sleeve, we did a program with the founder of the psionic sleeve and how he came about doing this. That is on our YouTube channel, so you may want to, you know, check that out as well. You go to our YouTube channel and just type in psionic sleeve, which, as Dr. Boster said, begins with a C, not an S. And coincidentally, though, well, not really not coincidentally, but to know better about that, that device is fitted for you specifically. But it's not available in every state of the United States because for some reason they don't have... Um, I don't know what kind of approval they need for it, but regardless, it's not available in each and every state. So you would have to go to their website and see if you're in a in a state that even approves you to get this. OK, so thank you for that. All right. Next, a person writes a person writes a person asks more about the obesity, obesity. And are there specific foods that they might be eating that could be causing obesity and or alcoholic beverages so so this is a really big topic um, and uh, I have a keen interest in nutrition uh, in in the setting of multiple sclerosis um, so I've got a bunch of YouTube videos on the topic but just to talk about it a, a little bit right now um, it's a fool I think who doesn't appreciate that what you put in your mouth can have an impact on how you feel or how you're doing Right. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, the, the calories that you take in can have an impact on how how much you weigh or how big you get. I'm going to throw out a couple of things that I think all people with MS should consider, independent of any other diet considerations. Number one, I want you to up your water game. So we need adult men with MS to be drinking 120 ounces of water a day. That's a lot of water. And we need women with MS to be drinking at least 100 ounces of water a day. Now, that will help you with myriad symptoms, but it will also help you lose weight um, for a lot of different reasons. And if you don't believe me, try it for a month. After that, I obviously want people to be taking vitamin D for different reasons that are outside the scope of the question. But I then want you to pay really close attention to food quality. And I want you to avoid high fructose corn syrup as if it was the plague. I want you to avoid sugar-laden foods and heavily processed foods. I want you to avoid fast foods and fried foods and diet foods. And specifically, I want you to not eat anything that has a, a, an ingredient that you can't pronounce. So after you finish like the second grade, you know every food there is, right? And if you're looking at the ingredients on something that's supposedly food and it's got a bunch of words you can't pronounce, guess what? That's not food. That's a chemical. So if you did nothing but increase your water game and up the quality of the food that you eat by avoiding heavily processed foods and high fructose corn syrup and sugar laden foods, you would be shocked at the difference that you can see. Now, alcohol or alcohol is not something that provides us with nutrition and it's got a bunch of empty calories. I am not suggesting that people listening should be a teetotaler and never touch an alcoholic beverage. But I do think if we're trying to control weight, we have to consider that the alcohol that we drink um, has a lot of carbs in it and it can contribute to weight gain. 
So it must factor into a decision as we're trying to control obesity. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Now, person also asked, um, what is the name, what is the drug name for the obesity that you mentioned earlier? So, so there's, um, there's several of them. Um, there's semaglutides, uh, and Majorno is one that I mentioned earlier. Um, th these, these medicines are really clever injections that are given, and they can do miraculous things with weight loss, but it takes a really careful hand to use them. Um, and I don't think it's something that you should, you know, just take airy fairy. For example, when you take these medicines, you can lose fat and muscle, and you don't want to lose muscle. So I really feel strongly that someone who's gonna use one of these medicines needs to be involved in a nutrition and an exercise regimen so that they can preserve their skeletal muscle mass as much as possible as they lose fat. Okay, thank you for that. Um, do you ever hear of PTTD and, uh, well, PTTD is a posterior tibial tendon deficiency. And, Supposedly that has something to do with MS and the MS tendons and tissues causing problems with the feet. We're back to that again. Do you know anything about that? Respectfully, no. Okay, let's go on to the next question then because there's a lot of questions. All right, next one is, um, next one is, should electrolytes be used be be used for drinking more so than just drinking water? So when you're drinking water, if you can actually drink too much water. Now, I don't think 100 ounces of water a day is too much water, but sometimes uh, when we're drinking a decent amount of water, putting some electrolytes in it, which is just salt, is a really good idea. Salt? Um, now, salt is the electrolytes that we're talking about. Okay. So um, I will sometimes, for example, literally take a pinch of sea salt and put it in my soda water when I'm drinking. Um, and that's more than adequate. There's all kinds of money that you can spend on various electrolytes packets and things like that. Um, and I don't think that it's a sheer requirement, but, but I do think that if you're doing a really good job of drinking water, adding in an electrolyte or a pinch of salt in one or two of, of the bottles goes, it's tasteless and it can give you the potassium and sodium and stuff like that that you need. Okay, thank you for that. All right, next, because the reason why I question salt is because I know uh, recently I had heard for somebody else that I was with that they were prescribed to take electrolytes and that you could go to the local food store and pick up packages of these electrolytes to mix with, with different juices. I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't look at the product, so I don't know, but I didn't imagine it to be just salt. It's just salt. It's just like potassium, sodium, stuff like that. Chloride. Yep. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. Next. Um, what do we have here? We have, gosh, I got to sort through these questions. Dr. Shapiro recommends a bag of frozen peas for foreplay sexual pleasure. I have never um, had the uh, fortune of learning about that. They better not, not be frozen. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure how you would do that, but I would be delighted to learn. I'm, I'm, I'm a Dr. Shapiro, I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, uh, back, to, that's funny. Back to memory and cog fog. Okay, if we've already done a psych eval for baseline, how soon should we repeat it and how often? So let's talk about that a little bit. When you get an MRI of your brain, that's a picture of structure. Right. So it's showing you the structure. It's not showing you function. So, for example, if I take a picture of your house, I don't know whether you're having dinner. All I know is like what the outside of your house looks like. So if we want to best understand thinking and memory, a picture is not going to help us as much as an in-depth look at the function. And the way that we do that is with neuropsychometric testing or neuropsych testing. Neuropsych testing is often done in an office with paper and pencil and an, and an examiner. And it's like three to five hours of like the real new holy field of, of tests to look at all different aspects of cognition. You can't fudge the test and you can't study for the test. Just get a good night's sleep and then you want to go and give your best efforts. And the report that it generates is brilliant because it will show you for your educational level and age, 
how do you perform compared to others? And invariably, it will find a couple things that you're way better at than everyone else, a bunch of things that you do as well as everyone else, and then there may be like two or three things that you're not very good at. And if we can figure out what these are, we can develop strategies to overcome them. Now, neuropsychometric testing is extremely valuable when done serially, meaning done over time. And I personally like to repeat neurocog testing or neuropsychometric testing at a span of about two to three years. Mm. Situations where we might do it longer, I oftentimes don't wanna do it shorter, but if I get neuropsych and then a couple years later, two, three years later, get another neuropsych, it gives me a very, very strong sense of the direction that we're going in. And I found that to be super valuable. Okay, thank you for that. All right, next we have, done on this page, thankfully. All right, next we, we have a lot of stuff here. All right, a person writes that she was diagnosed with relapse and remitting MS in 2014. Um, excuse me, she was di yeah, diagnosed with RMS in 2014 with Sorgen's syndrome, psoriasis, and, endometrio and endometriosis. And then um, along with anxiety and depression. That is a lot to have to deal with. So 100%. what can you what can you say for this person? So so again, I go back to my mentor's comment that sometimes nature is too generous, um, and I'm listening to someone that has not one but two autoimmune conditions, and so we want to be very aggressive about controlling the Sjogren syndrome. We want to be very aggressive about controlling the MS, and then we want to pick apart those other things. Um, the endometriosis can be treated. Um, we, we want to be laser focused on trying to minimize and treat those comorbid conditions so that you can live your very best life. You didn't choose to have all those things, but you can choose to fight all of them. And you want to amass a village, a team, which is going to probably involve a rheumatologist. It's probably going to involve a neurologist and maybe a couple other team members so that you can thwart them. Okay, thank you. And because I can't remember, what do you have for confusion? So, so, you know, when we talk about confusion, there's a lot of different things that we need to keep in mind. We mentioned earlier that there are medicines that can trick your brain into being more awake, like the modafinil and the armodafinil and the Adderalls and those things. I also mentioned to you that we want to treat um, depression because untreated depression can make cognition worse. I'll take the discussion a little bit further. And the next thing I wanna do is I wanna remove naughty medicines. There are many, many medicines which are used with the best of intentions, which can impair cognition. For example, some of the most common medicines to treat bladder risk causing cognitive impairment. So medicines like Ditropan or Detrol are notorious for causing cognitive impairment, particularly in folks that are over 60. There are other medicines for bladder that do not cause cognitive impairment. And so screening your medicines with your neurologist or with your primary care doctor, or even with your pharmacist to look for those things are really important. I mentioned earlier the importance of treating spasticity, but spasticity medicines can contribute to cognitive impairment. Same thing with neuropathic pain medicines. So when a doctor puts you on a pill, we need to do a deep dive and make sure that pill is not going to create a problem elsewhere. And polypharmacy, which is a doctor word for gosh, you're on a lot of medicines, is typically defined as being on more than five medicines, is ubiquitous. It's very, very common in the setting of MS. So here's my suggestion. If your doctor wants to put you on a new medicine, say, okay, which one are you gonna remove? and see if they can remove a medicine. And each time you see your doctor, I think it's fair to say, hey, by the way, doc, which med can we cut in half? And I think that we always need to keep top of mind that we want to reduce the number of medicines and the doses as low as we can to reduce comorbid problems like cognitive impairment. Thank you for that. All right, um, going back to, going back to so much here, it's hard to go back to. All right, going back to the bladder issues, uh, excuse me, going back to the obesity question, you were talking about adding a lot more water to your diet. What does that do for the people who are already having problems with peeing? 
Um, and drinking 120 ounces a day for men and 100 ounces a day for women, as you said, I mean, that's a hell of a lot of water to be peeing out somewhere. And if somebody's got um, urgency issues and is obese, what do they do? So this is a very good question. Um, it's, it makes common sense that if you have pee pee problems and you avoid drinking, you'll have less pee pee problems, except that's not true. The common sense does not play out medically. The reason is you make urine based on filtering your blood. So even if you don't drink anything, you're gonna make some urine. Here's the problem. That urine will be profoundly concentrated. It'll be super, super concentrated. Concentrated urine has a lot of urea in it, which is a bladder irritant. Concentrated urine will cause that bladder to spasm and cramp, and it will make overactive bladder worse. Moreover, concentrated urine is an outstanding environment for bacteria to grow. And so someone who's not drinking adequate amounts of water actually will have more problems with bladder incontinence and more problems with ur urinary tract infections. Hmm. If you are drinking a lot of water and you're peeing a lot, you're constantly flushing the bladder. And you'll notice that the urine is dilute. It'll look clear. It won't be bright yellow or straw because it's diluted. That removes the bladder irritants and it causes less spasms of the bladder. And it constantly flushes away the bacteria. So you have much less likely risk of developing a urinary tract infection. Now, I agree with you that, that that's a lot of water. And I wanna talk about when we drink that water, right? Many red-blooded Americans um, don't drink much at all during the day. Maybe they drink caffeine in the form of coffee or soda pop, and that dehydrates you further. And they get home, and they're really, really thirsty. And so before they go to bed, they start chugging water, and they're drinking water, and they literally will bring water to the bedside table, right? Well, that's a problem because you're going to get up 100 times a night to go pee, and then you won't get restored to sleep. So here's what I want you to do. Let's take a gal that needs to drink 100, 100 ounces of water. I want you to drink a glass of water with breakfast. And come on now, that's not asking too much of you. You have breakfast, you have eggs, you have grits, you have a little coffee, you have a Danish, and you have a glass of water. You can do that. Then I want you to drink a glass of water with lunch. So whatever you're gonna have for lunch, you have a little sandwich, you have a little iced tea, you just add a water. I want you to drink a glass of water with dinner. All right, so we got three glasses of water. Now it's real easy. I simply need you to drink one glass of water between breakfast and lunch. It's not too much. You got four or five hours to drink one glass. Then I need you to drink one glass of water between lunch and dinner. And after dinner, I want you to stop drinking. If you do what I just mentioned, you have consumed two thirds of all the fluid you're going to drink in the first half of your day. And you've consumed 100 ounces of water through dinner. The reason I like that is when you drink something, you make urine for six hours. So if you eat dinner at six, you're gonna make urine until midnight, which is pretty late. But if you drink until 11 p.m., you are making urine all night long. And so when you're drinking adequate amounts of water, you wanna stack it in the first half of the day. Okay, thank you for that. Wow, that was a lot. That was a tremendous amount. Okay, let's see what's next, because we have a lot to go with what's, with what's next. Um, baclofen, let's talk about baclofen for a minute. One of the medicines that contribute to confusion, you said, is baclofen to help baclofen. I mean, to help confusion. I'm getting so confused, I can't think about it. All right. Um, wait, let me go get some baclofen. All right. Uh, but um, how does that um, how does that negatively affect multiple sclerosis? So, so again, we're talking about side effects of medicines. So, if you have a cramp, a spasm, a Charlie horse. If you have a stiff leg, that can really create a lot of problems for you. Not only can it cause contractures and decubitus ulcers, but it hurts like the Dickens. It can make you walk wonky or make you at high risk of falling, right? So that's spasticity and we can treat that. However, the medicines like baclofen do have side effects. And baclofen, I joke, is a distant cousin of beer. And the symptoms or the side effects are groggy, dizzy, sleepy. Now, fortunately, you can acclimate to it over time. And again, we wanna use the least amount of medicine possible for the benefit that we're trying to seek. 
So if we can use a, a very small amount of medicine, for example, half a pill of 10 milligrams, so five milligrams of baclofen in the morning and five milligrams in the afternoon, we might take a bigger dose at night before we go to bed. We need to game out improving spasticity with managing the side effect profile. Both are important. Absolutely. That was a great question. Great. Right, thank you. Glad I thought of it. No, I'm joking. Um, all right. Uh, next, let's get into something else here for a moment. Person writes, I'm a stem cell transplant, transplant survivor from leukemia 2011. Take IVIG infusions every six weeks. I don't take any DMTs. I was told the infusions may work like a DMT. Do you have any information regarding this? I'm in remission and of and no new lesions. So, so the person uh, is talking about a medicine called intravenous immunoglobulin. So that's like a bunch of scrabble words. So intravenous means in the vein, IV. IG, immunoglobulin, is antibodies. And so what IV, IG is, is a bag full of antibodies. What happens is when people donate blood, they separate the red blood cells from everything else. And they harvest all the antibodies in the blood from literally hundreds of thousands of donors. And then they clean it so it's safe. And they package it in a bag. And they infuse that into you. IVIG has been inadequately studied in MS, but it has been studied. And I am a firm believer that it works. Now, the data is wishy-washy. And there are trials that say it doesn't. Um, there are a couple of trials that say that it might. Uh, I can tell you anecdotally in my own experience, I think it's actually a, an, an effective medicine to treat MS. It's a very expensive medicine, and it also has a lot of side effects that can occur with it, but I do think that it is a viable MS treatment. Hey, thank you for that. Next, next, next. We have so many questions to look through, it's hard to see them all. Uh, let me get back to the top. How do you help with SPSM in 65-year-old? Anything beyond exercise to slow disease progression? So I think they're talking about secondary progressive MS, and they're talking about right. someone who's rather young at age 65, because 65 is the new 30. Um, a couple. Of, did, did you do that because I just turned 65? No, oh I just. God, thank you so much. Very young. Yeah, I'm going to send you roses. So, right. so. The, the first of all, let's not be ageist, okay? So just because someone is 65 or 64 or 67 or 82 or whatever, it doesn't really matter too much to me. I want to help this person be the most functional person they can be. And this gets into a very heated debate raging right now amongst MS neurologists about if we should stop treatment as people age. Now, there are two camps to this debate, those that think you should, who happen to be wrong, and those that think you shouldn't, like myself, who happen to be right. It's a joke. But my point is, is that I don't want to stop disease modification in someone who happens to have celebrated a particular birthday. Um, the, the MS medicines, particularly the newer ones, do more than just decrease relapses. They can slow disability progression, and very importantly, they can slow brain volume loss. So, Someone who has uh, so-called secondary progressive MS has a relapsing form of MS, and at least at my center, we're going to keep on keeping on treating you so that you can live your very best life. There's data that is very bothersome to me that if you take a bunch of 55-year-olds who are like babies, 55-year-old people that have had MS and they've been stable for five years and you stop their medicines, only one-third of them go on to have progressive disability. And the authors said that was okay. And if my mom is in that cohort, absolutely not, not okay. And so I want to apply the most effective disease modifying therapy that you're comfortable taking, even though you happen to have celebrated a 65th birthday. Okay, thank you for that. Next, um, Dr. Boster has said in the past that a person should continue taking MS therapy for their entire lifetime. If someone has been stable for 15 years and is over 60, what are the safer medications that he might consider or might suggest a person in this case consider to be using? Yep, this is a great last question. I really like this question. Um, and it really gets to the concept of de-escalation. 
right? Now this might be a little bit outside the discussion of comorbidities, but so be it, we'll end on this powerful note. Um, it is reasonable in my mind, as someone gets a little bit older, we might choose to de-escalate the medicine to pick a medicine that is more safe. Um, and that I do think is a reasonable thing. So what are some things that I might consider? I'll throw out two medicines that I'm fond of using in this space, uh, although there are many, many. One is uh, Abagio teraflutamide, um, which I think does a bang up job of slowing brain volume loss. I think it does an outstanding job of slowing disability progression. It's just so-so at relapses and it's just so-so at new MRI spots. But when we're dealing with someone who's 60, statistically, we're much more concerned about brain volume loss and progression than we are about the other stuff. So I think that's a fantastic medicine. Similarly, I am very fond of using Mavenclad in someone that age. Mavenclad is a discontinuous therapy. You take 10 pills the first year and then 10 pills the second year, and then you don't take any more unless you have new disease activity. And so the risk benefit of exposing a 60 something to Mavenclad, I think is really in their favor. So those are just two examples. Now, again, keep in mind, um, this is not gospel, it's just my opinion. And just because I'm opinionated doesn't make me right, but that's the way that I treat. And I think it works really, really well in, with this de-escalation model. Right, thank you for that. Thank you, doctor. Thanks for being here. As always, namaste. Take that's care. Right. Thank you, take care.